Hey guys, how are you doing? Are you ready for, for your exams? No. <laughs> yeah, it was much nicer at the end of August, you know. The semester was just beginning and the weather was so nice. Now it's winter time in Berkeley, which means like 60 degrees or something. 55. So, uh, today is the review lecture, okay? Um, in the last few lectures, I gave you an overview from the kind of a theoretical point of view of what this course is about, and in particular, this last chapter that we have studied. And today, I would like to focus more on practical aspects of, of it, and uh, basically on the question, what do you need to know to do well on the final exam, okay? So I'll go over the most important points of the material which we'll focus on on the final exam, which, again, will be on December 19th, and um, I'm not going to go over all the information again. Everything is available on, uh, on, online uh, here and also on this space. I will, I will also have last-minute office hours on the day before, on the 18th, in case you, uh, you know, suddenly don't see the difference between coral and divergence and you panic <laughs> the night before. You can come to uh, see me on, uh, on the 18th and we'll sort it out. I'll sort it out for you. Okay. Um, also, I want to tell you one more time that the exam will be at Curse Gym in three different rooms, okay? And uh, you will, uh, the room is determined by your section. Which is determined by who your GSI is. And your GSIs have already announced the, room, the rooms for, for you. But you can find all this information again here and here. Okay? But you should be aware of where your exam room is. It's important that you are at the right place. You don't end up in a, uh, you know, it's first gym, so it's big and uh, it's easy to get lost. So be sure you know which room you should, uh, you should show up at. Okay. Any questions about the organizational aspects of the, of the final? Okay, good. So now let's talk about the material. I already um, said that this exam will focus on the material um, after the second midterm, what we call the third season. And, but it doesn't mean that you should forget what happened in the first two seasons. Meaning that certainly problems, solving all the problems will require skills which you learned before. You should not forget all this stuff, right? Especially multiple integrals are a very important uh, part of, the, of, this, of, of this material. So I think it's a good idea to go over that old material. Perhaps not devote as much time as the material of the last chapter, which we studied since the last exam. But uh, you should probably review it nonetheless. Any questions from this part of the audience? No? Okay. Now, so I would like to break it into um, the material. So I will only talk about the material since the last exam. But again, don't take it as meaning that you should not know anything about what happened before. You should, uh, but the focus will be on this material. Okay, that's why I'm going over this material now. All right. So the first thing I would like to talk about is integrals. In this, uh, in this uh, part of the course, we have talked about different kinds of integrals. And I'd like to summarize again what those integrals are and what kind of information you need to be able to compute them. So the first thing I want to focus on is just the integrals. What kind of integrals? Well, we integrate over curves and we integrate over surfaces. So there are two types of integrals, first of all, depending on the dimension of the domain. Let me talk first about integrals over curves. Over curves. So here we have two types of integrals also. The type one integral is an integral of a function. So this is an integral which looks like this. You have f ds, where f is a function over curve. So a curve here could be over, uh, um, could be a, uh, a curve on the plane, that is R2, or in space, on plane or in space. But the way we handle these integrals is very similar. Now, how do we compute such an integral? So to compute such an integral, the first step is to parameterize your curve. Parameterize the curve. So, which, by the way, was the very first uh, subject that we learned in this course. So this is a good example of what I mean when I say, you know, revisit, uh, review the material from the previous chapters. Because certainly to be able to do such an integral, you have to know how to parameterize curves. And that's something we learned at the very beginning. Okay. So, parameterizing, parameterizing the curve means, means introducing an auxiliary parameter, which we usually call t, but you may call it something else if you like, in writing each of the coordinates as functions of this auxiliary parameter. So, you would have x as a function of this parameter t, y as a function of this parameter t, and z as a function of this parameter t. That would be in the case when the curve is in space, if it's on a plane, it, you would only have x and y, of course. Right? And once you do that, this integral, ah, and then you have to say that t, what is the range for this auxiliary parameter t? And the range will be between some numbers a and b. So then this integral will be equal to the integral of f, where instead of x, y, and z, you, introduce, you insert those three functions, x of t, y of t, z of t. Right? And you integrate from a to b. But in addition, you also have to insert a factor which has to do with the arc length of the curve. And that would be the following, x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared plus z prime of t squared. And finally, dt. And again, if you are on the plane, you just don't have the z variable. You just erase this, but then you get the formula from the plane. Now, what does this represent? This represents mass of, uh, say, a thin wire in the shape of, of this curve. In the shape of this curve. If f is a density function, is mass density function. Also, remember that if f is equal to 1, if f is equal to 1, in other words, you just, you just have the square root, this integral represents simply the arc length. Arc length of the curve. So this integral, this integral measures um, the total mass or total length of this um, of this object, this curve. Okay, that's what this integral is about. It's very easy to distinguish this integral from the next type of integral because you see that in this integral you integrate functions, whereas the second type of integral you integrate vector fields. So in the second type you have an integral of vector field rather than function. F is vector field. So as such, it has components. I uh, in front of I you have P, in front of J you have Q, and then you have a third component R. If it's a vector field on, on in space, if it's on the plane, again you only have two components. Okay. So vector field is uh, more than a function. It's, it has three components in space, two components on the plane. And this integral can be also rewritten as p dx plus q dy plus r dz. This is the same. It's the same. Because uh, dr here stands for dxi plus dyj plus dzk. And so if you take the dot product of these two, you end up with this formula. So these are two different ways to write um, 
uh, aligned integral of the vector field, either this way or that way. It's the same. Okay. In the case of a, of a line integral vector field, there is an additional complication, which we don't have for integrals of this type. For integral of this type, it's enough to just write this. You have to specify the curve, you have to specify the function, and that's it. But in the case of a line integral of a vector field, you have, to, you have to specify an additional piece of data. So which I, can, I want to emphasize. Here you need orientation. We'll see. Of course, when I say you need to specify, what I really mean is that I need to specify. In other words, when I give, if I give you a problem, compute this line integral. I have to tell you with respect to which orientation. Okay? If, I, if I don't tell you, it means that the problem is not well posed, unless you have to find, uh, unless you know, there's something which should enable you to find orientation. In other words, this is not well defined if you just have the vector field and the curve. You have to also have orientation on this curve. What do I mean by orientation? A curve is going to be to look like this. So it goes from some point A to point B. And orientation means the direction, which way do we traverse this curve. So there are two possible orientations. Here's one orientation, and here's another orientation. We can go from A to B, we can go from B to A. And of course, the answer, if you choose the first orientation, is going to be just a negative of the answer if you use, choose the second orientation. But it's a different answer. Unless the integral is just zero, you will get a different answer depending on which orientation you choose. So orientation has to be specified, and you have to follow that orientation. So you have to be careful when you set up such an integral to make sure that you are computing it in the right direction. You're doing it the integral oriented in the, right, in the right way. Of course, here I have drawn a curve which has two endpoints. There are also curves which do not have endpoints. Closed curves. Here's an example of a closed curve. In the case of a closed curve, it also has two orientations, two orientations, which we usually call clockwise and counterclockwise. Right? So counterclockwise is this one. There is also a somewhat misleading terminology in the book, which is called positive orientation, which I would prefer not to use because it's positive. It's a, it's a matter of convention. Right? So, so let's just call it counterclockwise or clockwise. In the book, counterclockwise is also called positive. But I think it's, uh, there's potential for, uh, for misunderstanding if you use that terminology. So let's just stick to clockwise, counterclockwise. I think it's, fairly, it's very self-explanatory. OK, now let's say, let's suppose you have this. Um, you have chosen, chosen such an orientation. What will be, um, what will this, how to compute this integral? So there, you use, again, parameterization like this. But now it's important to make sure that your orientation that you've chosen is, um, agrees with the orientation on the auxiliary parameter t. This t is actually, it just belongs to the one-dimensional space, to the line. And the line is oriented because points on the line correspond to numbers, and numbers are oriented. We can say which number is bigger uh, between any two numbers. So when we write it like this, it means that we, we identify the curve with the interval from a to b. And the interval from a to b is always oriented from a to b like this, right? So let's suppose that under the parameterization, you choose the orientation like this. So it goes from this point to this point. And this point is t equal a, and this point is t equal b. Okay? Let's suppose that. In this case, this integral is computed as an integral from a to b of p x prime t dt, well, let's just write like this, plus q y prime plus r z, z prime dt. But here is, a, here is a possible trick question. Let's suppose I will ask you on the exam to compute such a line integral where the curve is oriented in a different way. Okay? So if you don't pay attention, you would say, okay, that's just, a, you would find your parameterization, where again, let's say t equal a corresponds to this, and t equal b corresponds to this, let's suppose. And then you, if you don't pay attention to this stuff, to the orientation, you might want to write it again like this. And that would be wrong, you see, because you have to make sure that with respect to the orientation which you are told to use, the, the parameterization is such that, you know, the, the lowest one is the initial point, the lowest value A is the initial point, and the larger, largest value B is corresponds to the end point. In this picture, that's the case, and that's why we end up with this integral from A to B. That, in other words, the integral that I got with respect to T has this orientation, which comes from the orientation of the curve. But if the orientation is like this, you have to go from T equal B to T equal A, right? Because you have to go from this point to this point. This point corresponds to T equal B. This point corresponds to T equal A. That's why, so in this case, then you should write it as from B to A, and then the same thing. Then, of course, what is integral from B to A? Integral from B to A is the same as negative integral from A to B. So you will actually end up with minus this integral. Okay? Is that clear? Ask me if it's not clear. So this is a, this is a subtle point, which you have, to, you have to remember. Now, what does, this, what does this integral represent? Interpretation of this integral is that it, it represents uh, work done by force. This is work done by force. By force F along C from the point A to the point B. You see, from this, if you think about this interpretation, it's, um, it becomes more, um, it becomes more clear why there's a sign. Because when you talk about the work done by force, the force is moving an object, or it may be resisting a movement of the object, right? And, and so it's important whether you go from A to B or from B to A. If the force, let's say the force, let's say the force is, comes from the wind, and the wind is blowing this way. And so the, the wind is carrying me this way, so the, the wind does, does perform a certain amount of work, right? And this work is positive. But what if the wind is blowing this way, but I'm still, I still insist on going there, okay? Because I'm stubborn, so I, I go against the wind. So in that case, I, I, I do work, not the wind, and so the wind is resisting me, therefore the work of the wind is negative, you see? So it's important to know not just the trajectory of the object, but, but it's also important, uh, the, the, uh, you know, whether the relative position of the force and the, and the trajectory. In other words, the orientation of the trajectory relative to the uh, direction of the vector field. You see, so, that, so it becomes more clear that if, if I go this way, uh, if I go this way against the wind, it's a negative uh, uh, work. If I go this way with the wind, it will be positive. Okay? You have a question? That's right. That's right. When I write it like this, so the question is about this PQR. In this formula, I spelled it out. I wrote f as of, f is a function of x, y, z. But now x, y, z have become functions of t, so I substitute these three functions into f. Likewise, in this formula, I didn't write it just to save time. But what I mean by this is. And the same, same similar for, for Q and I, uh, for Q and I. Okay. So the orientation is important. It causes a change of orientation uh, results in, in the appearance of a sign. Okay. So that's that's pretty much all about the setup of integrals for curves. So next we move on to integrals over surfaces. 
I think it goes over surfaces. So what do we need to know here? Here, again, there are two types of integrals that we are interested in. And there is a lot of similarity between the first type for surfaces and the first type for curves, and the second type for surfaces and the second type for curves. So the first integrals of the first type over surfaces are integrals of functions. So here, again, f is a function. And, uh, in this case, uh, you have a surface m, and it is embedded in R3. You could also have a surface embedded in R2. And that would be just a, a region on the plane, like this. right? But that's, so that's integrating over such regions was the subject of uh, the earlier chapter, of course. Chapter 15. They said that's the usual double integrals. So here the novelty is when you look at surfaces in R3, which do not fit in R2, which cannot fit in the plane, but only fit in a three-dimensional space, like a sphere, or part of a sphere. Right? So what I'm talking about is something like this. Like a cap, a cap like this. That would be M. So what, what does, uh, how do I compute this? Again, um, to compute, I have to parameterize my surface. Parameterize. Because it is now two-dimensional, I have to use two auxiliary parameters, which we usually call U and V. And so we write X is some function of U and V. Y is some function of u and v, and z is a function of u and v, where u and v run over points of some domain already on the plane. So what I'm doing is that I'm trying to identify a curved surface like this, like this m, with a flat surface like this, which I call d. So each point here would correspond to a point here, and this is one to one correspondence. That's what this parameterization uh, means. Once you have this parameterization, you have a formula for, um, for this integral. To write this formula, I will use the following notation. I'll call r of uv the vector field, which is obtained from this parameterization by interpreting each of the three functions, x, y, and z, as components of a, of a three vector. So you'll have x of u, v, i, plus y of u, v, j, plus z of u, v, k. This is vector r. And so to, I can differentiate this vector. For example, r sub u will simply mean uh, x sub u times i plus y sub u times j plus z sub u times k. So again, this stands for partial derivative of x with respect to u. This is a partial derivative, partial derivative with respect to u. So this is, a, this, is, this is another example of something which we use in this part of the course. We're building on some material that we learned before, because, of course, we learned uh, partial derivatives earlier, right, before this second so, so again, you have to know, how, for example, how to compute partial derivatives. Without knowing how to compute partial derivatives, you would not be able to compute such integrals. Once, okay, so once we have this, we also have r sub, r sub v. Defined in a similar way, you just put derivatives with respect to v instead of u. Then the formula is the following. Ah, I actually made a, I only drew one sign of integration. I should have drawn two, two signs of integration. For double integrals, we draw two signs. Well, it's not a big deal. I will not deduct points for this, since I've made the same mistake. So I'll go easy on you if you put the one integration sign instead of two for double integrals. But for triple integrals, you should put more than one. For double integrals, I will be, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be lenient on double integrals, in terms of how many integral signs you put. Okay, let me put two signs here, though. So integral over this m, you'll be able to write as a double integral over d, where here you will put f, where again you put x of uv, y of uv, and z of uv. And then you will put r sub u cross r sub v. This is the cost product. Again, something we learned before. And then you take the magnitude of this vector, dA. dA is the usual measure of integration on, on the uv plane. So this term, r u cross r v, is just like this term, which you have for integrals of functions over, um, over curves, the first type of integral. It's an analog, it's an analog of that. That, that uh, r u cross r v, absolute value, is an analog of this. Okay. So now the question really becomes, how do you parameterize it? Once you parameterize it, once you parameterize it, it's very easy because you just need to compute the derivatives and you take a cross product and you end up with, a, with just an ordinary double integral. But the question is, how do you, how do you compute this? So, well, there are, there are at least two special cases which you should know. The first special case is when your, your surface is part of a graph. It's part of, gra of the graph of a function. In this case, the formula simplifies. And in fact, it's a good idea to remember, uh, to remember this formula. But you will actually have a cheat sheet, so you might as well just write it on the cheat sheet. You don't have to remember. Okay, so special cases. The first special case is when, when, the, when the surface M is part of the graph of some function G of X, Y. So in this case, what we can do is we can just say that X is U, Y is V, and Z is G of U, V. Okay? Or we can just stop pretending that u and v are two, separate, are two additional auxiliary variables and just call them what they are. I mean, let's just call this auxiliary variables x and y. So that the parameterization will be in terms of x and y. And